Good morning, Katie Hilbert. It's so delightful to have you here in our We Choose to Thrive series, and so happy that you would take the time to share your story with us. And the whole idea behind We Choose to Thrive is that we want to give a message of hope and inspiration to women that are wanting to take that step, are realizing they need to take that step, but it seems like a big one. And it is a big one. But uh, yes, you know, as we share our stories, it's that message of hope and inspiration that they're not alone, and that that we have formed a sisterhood to help support them. So, give us a little bit of your backstory before we go into what you've been doing to to thrive and be happy and all the things that that are so necessary to live a very happy life. Well, you know, my story is a little multi-layered, but. Um, I was at about three years old, my parents joined a um, cult, and it was based out of the shepherding movement. A lot of people kind of know what it, that is, some don't, who weren't around in the 80s, but or 70s and 80s, but it's kind of, if you research it online, uh, it's likened to Jonestown minus mm -hmm. the Kool-Aid. <laughs> wow. So that's what, that's what Pat Robertson said, and it's pretty accurate, it's very about, it was based in a lot of control and you do whatever your shepherd aka your pastor tells you to do and you know there was one person quoted saying um if god almighty was standing in front of me and i knew it was him and he told me to do something and my shepherd told me to do something else i would do whatever my shepherd said that's amazing because of the control that there is and that's kind of how what my background is this and it was from my own father but he was that type of person yeah yeah, it was very, everything was a lot of mind control, a lot of, and then obviously what goes with that is a lot of warped teaching, um, a lot of spiritual abuse. Unfortunately, that also is a breeding ground for really disturbed, perverse people. So there was a lot of sexual abuse. Uh, a lot of it was, there was a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. There was a lot of group stuff that went on. Um, that went on for me from the ages of three until nine. Oh my goodness. Um, so it was really not great. <laughs> Still hard to think about sometimes. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as tears are welling up <laughs> in my eyes. And then my home life was very chaotic. My father has multiple personalities. It doesn't get really get diagnosed till later, so we didn't really understand. You know, you just as a kid, it was just chaos. It was, you know, literally one minute something's happening you know I break a window him and I are joking about it let's not tell your mom ha, 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 ha. and 15 minutes later I'm being screamed at and I'm the worst person that ever lived and can't believe you would do this and I have all this stuff going on that I can't even my parents don't even really know about which I, I know now of all the sexual abuse and all the different things that are going on and then we've got <laughs> crazy town over here who is just creating this I never know where I stand. I don't never know what's going on. So it kind of created this internal fight or flight 24 seven mm -hmm. inside. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you just don't ever, there's never any peace. It's just a constant state of fear. You know, <laughs> I go to school cause it was, you know, everything's, it, you know, it's a, it's a cult, right? So we all live in a communal environment, like the whole deal. <laughs> so it's, you know, it kind of creates the, I, when I'm away from home, it's scary and a lot of horrible shit is happening. And then I go home and it's scary and horrible shit is happening. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of sexual abuse within my family uh, as well. So, you know, it was a bit of a shitty situation for quite a bit. <laughs> well, then, you know, then that as you grow into adulthood, we seem, seem to, to attract the same thing simply because that's what we know and we're familiar with. And Absolutely. it takes us many years to figure out our way in the world, you know, <laughs> and know, because we, I think deep down we know there's something better getting to the point where we're willing to take the steps and the action that's necessary to get to that better place is a whole nother thing, you know, especially yes. when you've been brought up as a very young child in this kind of environment. And I think we must have had the same father, you know. <laughs> was it that twin version? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were separated at birth, I guess. Maybe, <laughs> so what, yeah, what prompted your healing journey? Because you had th this, this stuff that, that 
colors your world and still colors your world to to a certain extent right. and yet we constantly work to rise above it but there are triggers there are things and sometimes even talking about it like right now is part of a trigger and i right. understand that but as we gain the courage to stand up and speak about about it i find for myself what had happened is that we that it started to lose its fire it started to lose mm. its hold because as you grow through it and and speak about it and and kind of process through it write about it those are some of my biggest healing things that have happened for me so yeah what started your journey of healing well when i was about 25 <laughs> took quite a while for the meltdown to come about but <laughs> i would say at uh, about 25 it just did the depression um, the a lot of the self hatred, a lot of the anxiety, it all just started to take over, and um, I was planning my suicide, and I was in my car, which is this is the hilarious thing about it. I mean, it's not really, but it is kind of like I was in school. I had gone back to college. I dropped out earlier, and I'd come back, and I was in my last year of uh, my degree, which was psychology and theology, which is hilarious. Oh, wow. And I'm <laughs> driving in my car, driving to my school, planning my death. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking, but it was, you know, it was that, I mean, I laugh about it because it's so surreal in a way. In the car, I, the only way for me to describe it is um, I felt it fit the physical presence of God. I felt, um, I heard an audible voice. It's the only time I've ever heard it in my life. And just said, go to the hospital, go to the hospital, go to the hospital. And um, so I said, okay, <laughs> fuck school. And I drove and I went to the check myself in at the psych ward and said, you don't help me. I'm walking out of here and this is it. And so um, <laughs> that's a nutshell of what went on. But it was a little bit more of me having a meltdown. But that kind of, I went on, you know, I got on antidepressants and it took about a week. And then something just it was like a light went on and I felt kind of normal for the first time. And I, during that time I thought, okay, I'm going to do, I literally said to myself, I'm going to do whatever the fuck it takes to get free. Excuse mm -hmm. my language. But that was the, I can't live like this anymore. Right. Um, and so that I would say that was the catalyst. I mean, there was a lot of this, mm -hmm. <laughs> there was still eating disorders to come and <laughs> different coping mechanisms to that would start and I would have to undo, you know, in the process since then, that was it. And I just thought, okay, I can't ever go back there. I don't know. <laughs> I can't do that. Right. And, um, cause like, it was like, I got my sanity. The antidepressants really did help me physically just kind of come into like a, that calmness that you, yeah. yeah. Just like yeah. I, the way I describe it is kind of, I think my emotional scale before that was like negative 10 to zero, like mm -hmm. the absence of, anxiety was my best day and it was really everyone else is working on a zero to ten scale and somebody else's zero was my like woo I'm functioning <laughs> yeah and um, what the uh, the drugs kind of did was put me in that zero to ten scale it was like I still had emotion it was just normal emotion it was you mm -hmm. know I'm when I'm I'm sad I'm sad and I actually started to experience some normal emotions that just stabilized me internally so it was really, really helpful for me Very cool. to do that. Yeah. And so then that was about the, you you're were 25. So mm -hmm. in moving forward, as you've gone through life, what has kept the balance? What do you do in life that resources have you tapped into? What mission in your own personal life um, have you adopted that has helped you stay the stable and to heal from what you've gone through? Um, I would say there's a, just a kind of a couple things that really have been that kind of thread in a sense of I did make a decision at probably I was about 29 uh, I used to be a pastor and <laughs> I've gone through it let me tell you I thought you know what I just I gotta let all this shit go everything I think I know I've got to let it go I'm gonna hold on to three things my faith is really essential to me but because it was so warped because of all the jacked up stuff, I decided mm -hmm. I'm going to hold on to three things that I know that I know that I know in my core. God is big. God is good. God is real. And he's bigger than me. That's it. Those are the only things I know for sure. Um, and just let the rest go. And it gave me permission to let go of the, a lot, a layer of the BS 
that mm-hmm. I was taught. And also, so I was able to use that as my, as my base. You know, you have to learn basic things that you never learned when you were a kid, right? Like that's right. some of the stuff that gets missed. I feel like in a lot of like self-help and all of that is like, what no one tells you is like, you don't actually know what the word trust means. Like people say, oh, well, just trust. Like, <laughs> I don't know what that actually means. I had to learn and through my, you know, even in my faith process of just, you know, praying and God would say to me, can you trust me for an hour? And I would be like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. And what that actually meant was, can you just not worry and not stress out about everything that you don't have a control over for one hour? And I, you know, I would have to like choose to do that. After about an hour, you know, the stress and the anxiety itself starts like, life is crazy, you know? And then like, there's so many things like that throughout the last 15 years of like, you just have to, it's like you, you have to go back and start over and learn stuff that you don't know how to do. Like mm-hmm. when pe- you know, people would say, let go and forgive. And like, those are concepts that make no sense to, I believe, at least for me, they, they were concepts that I just, I have no, there's no way to grasp them because you have no foundation. There's no foundation. I have noticed this. And to me, abuse is abuse, no matter what kind of abuse or when it happened. Mm-hmm. But, but what I have noticed, because I was also, you know, as a child, experienced a lot of abuse. What I've noticed is that people that have gone through the abuse in childhood versus somebody that had a wonderful childhood and then went through domestic violence or, or all the other abuses that can happen, rape, right. whatever, cyber abuse. If you had a really strong core as a, in childhood, there's a, there's a little bit of difference as far as how you react and how you, how you come out of something. Yes, it just shakes you to your core when it happens as an adult, but when you don't have the solid foundation as a child, wow, that it, it could, because you're, you're trying to learn all that stuff as an adult as well. Right. And, and get over it and understand it. And, and when you're told you're ugly and stupid and you're never going to make it in this world forever when you were a little one and you've had the other kind of abuses, your frame of reference is just exactly that. You know, yeah. that's your frame of reference. So where are you now? I see, you know, you're, you have the, the beauty of being able to express the emotion of what you've you've gone through and what you, what we continue because there's triggers that happen to us every day. Yeah. Where are you now in your journey? Um, The one other thing I was going to say, I kind of got sidetracked. I would say probably in the last few years, I just gave myself permission to just feel Mm -hmm. whatever I feel, do whatever I got to do and to stop trying to please anybody else or worry about anybody else because at the end of the day, I'm the only one living this life. Mm -hmm. And nobody else is inside. Nobody else knows what it feels like inside. And if that means you're sad, you're sad. And if that means I'm angry, I'm angry. And as soon as I really did that, really gave my permission to let go of relationships that were unhealthy, to let go of disappointingly or, you know, all of that kind of stuff. That's when, like, I think the really deep healing has started to happen. And I would say now I'm, I'm in a place where, it doesn't rule my life. It isn't, um, it isn't what I lead with. I actually don't right. really talk about it much. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm actually seeing that as a bit of an issue. <laughs> so I'm starting to realize that I have to share a little bit more. But it's a chapter. And it's not my defining chapter. Um, That's beautiful. That is so important, too. You know, because yeah. as you process through, you find the need to to talk about it less and less. But if you do talk about it, you're able to process it better. You know, because it used to be when I spoke about my stuff, I cry, you know, when I was trying to explain it, but now it's kind of like, it's, it's over there, you know, you know, it's, it's, it it happened and it's real. And I remember many things, but it doesn't have that crushing, like heavy weight that hangs. Yeah. Like a wet, what drenched blanket hanging over your head that makes it where you feel like you're smothering. Yeah. I would say, I would, I would say the same. It has that feeling of like, it's there. 
I know it's there. I don't think I'm probably as far along as you are. I'm going to be honest. It's not as separated from me. Um, but I, it doesn't control and it doesn't rule. And I've learned to uh, how to allow it, you know, where you can kind of, if I do talk about it and I do get emotional or things do come up, I'm able to like kind of let it come up now and then I move on and it, I don't get yeah, stuck in good. it for yeah. a month, you know, where, you know, that can trigger you and you just go with this I do know. Yeah. It's not yeah. like that. It's like, okay, in an hour or two, I can kind of process through the emotion and then I go on with my day and it's fine. And it's, it's not even a denial checkout. It's an actual genuine process through and move on. Um, which yeah. is for me fantastic because the, you know, I'm not wasting a month being in a, <laughs> being no, a I, hole about it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, so, I so get that because I, that you can get into that place where, and I recent, I had something recently happen that I really had to, you know, finally had to just find a way to snap myself out of it. And what I realized is I made a choice to thrive and to be happy and to love and to forgive myself even because yeah. part of that whole picture is still being able to to not forgiveness we do for ourselves and you know <laughs> yeah. and it's a selfish reason really that, yeah. we, that oh we forgive because because that's part of the healing so what would you what would you say to someone that is just starting down this road of realizing that they don't want to live this way anymore, that they know that there's more to life than the constant pain and grief that they're, they're feeling and the suffering they're going through. And they're real, willing to do what it, the, the work that it takes to, to make that journey of loving themselves and choosing to thrive. What would you say to somebody? I would say awesome, <laughs> first of all. Good job. Congrats. Give yourself permission to be on your journey and to go through whatever process you need to go to go through to get free. Just surrender to it because it's, you know, there's a, it's not really a way over it or around it. It's only through it, you know, and so it's, and everybody's journey looks different. And I think beating yourself up or judging yourself for what your process looks like only prolongs your process. It does. When, it really, really does. And really, at the end of the day, nobody else has walked your shoes. So nobody else's process is going to look exactly like yours. So give yourself permission and grace to do whatever you have to do to find yourself and to find your freedom. That's beautiful. That is perfect. I've done, this is probably my 40th interview. The first book had... <laughs> had 30 interviews in that book and then we're starting on the second book that you're participating in there's not been one person i haven't learned from you know mm. learned more about myself yeah. learned more about the healing process and the things that and and really there's no comparing one from the other you know oh my gosh. that's yeah. each one of us have our own journey and don't look at the next person and say well you had i had it way worse than you or vice versa it's mm -hmm. our journey, and it's uh, it's our lives, and we we are here to support each other, but they're not to compare, and not yeah. to not to say, well, yours was your abuse was nothing. Why are you complaining? Because uh. there, there's we can't say that. That is just no. not part of the picture, because we are beautiful human beings that are here for a reason, and our reason is to lift others up to help them also in their journey and right. and be a part of this something bigger that this is a wonderful life that we can live it's a matter of choosing and it can be a difficult choice <laughs> sometimes you you know as you choose it you you know sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back and there's um, always triggers and there's got to be grace for that too in your process for yourself of yes. like Sometimes you're going to have these monumental yes, and then sometimes you're going to have these like, why am I still stuck here? And yeah. to know that you're not alone in that. And everybody is, has a level of that going on. Even people who haven't been through massive trauma have a level of that going on. You they just do. don't see it. Yeah. It's just, that's part of the human process is, you know, we're, you're not always going to get it right every single time <laughs> and it's okay. We wish we could, okay. but that's not yeah, how it I is. know. <laughs> Please. Come on. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, Katie, thank you so much for this delightful interview. Um, and it'll be a part of our chapter. It'll also be 
we will be, you know, placing your video where others can see and hear your story because this is the important part of this whole thing. And right. I so appreciate that you've taken the time to, to share and be the wonderful you that you are. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I'm glad yeah. I got to. So, Very cool. Great. Thank you.